So, our message for tonight is, well, like I said, it's kind of two messages in one. So we're going to kind of just flow with this. We're, I'm just trusting the Lord that he's going to bring this all together. Um, because it's still, I have a lot of great scriptures I know I want to talk about. It's just the order, how it's going to all flow together, come together, all that kind of stuff. But it's kind of continuing a little bit off of what we were talking about two weeks ago before we took the week off for Thanksgiving, when we were talking about you are able to believe. And, man, it, this is a powerful truth. He, he, he's never going to ask you to do something that you can't do, that he hasn't empowered you to do. And so whatever it is that you need in your life, whatever you're believing him for, trusting him for, going after in your life, whatever situation, man, he has empowered you to be able to believe him for that thing. And so we're going to talk about, what we're going to talk about first, a pure heart, which is your key to powerful faith. And <clears throat> so for myself, I, you know, I tell you guys a lot about my morning time. I spend a lot of time in the morning with the Lord, reading the word, prayer time, things like that. And so I'd recently just finished up the New Testament again for my 27th time. And so I felt the Lord leading me to go back into the Old Testament. Now, I've only read the Old Testament three times, um, like all the way through, right? And so I'm going through the Old Testament right now. And so it's been really fun because, you know, I was talking with a friend the other day and he's like, you know, we were talking about just reading the word and, and been doing this quite a while now. And he said, so Kyle, what, like, you know, what's the difference have you seen in yourself or as you're reading the word now, as you've been through the New Testament 20 sometimes and, you know, through the Old Testament a number of times versus maybe still like the first time you're reading it, right? Or earlier on, as I thought about it, you know, I thought one of the things that stands out to me is as I'm reading the word now, as opposed to earlier on, there's just so much more peace and so much more clarity, so much more focus. You know, so I'm, as I'm reading, especially in the Old Testament, because it's, it's so, there's so many stories and there's so much going on. And so you've got to really be locked in to follow everything that's going on, right? And I've noticed for myself, as I'm reading it now again, as I'm reading through all these different things, I'm just following it and staying locked into what's going on. And as a result man, I'm getting so much more revelation out of what I'm reading. You know, because, because my, my, my focus is locked in, and as a result, man, my heart is open to it, right? Because you start getting distracted, you know? <laughs> you can even sit down reading the Word. It's like you read a whole chapter, like, wait a minute. What did I just, <laughs> what, did, what did I just read? Especially in the Old Testament where there's all these things going on, all these intricate parts. You can read a whole chapter if you don't, you can miss even two verses and you're going, wait, what happened here? right? And so for my own self, I just noticed, man, that that's the power of when we're putting that word in and putting that word in and putting that word in. Man, it just cleanses your heart. It cleanses your mind, right? And as a result, man, you're able to see so much clearer and so much deeper into the word of God while you're reading it. And it's like there's so much less junk, for lack of a better term, that it's got to go through for you, in order for you to process it. And so it, it just can come in so much more freely, and then things are just jumping off inside of me and setting me off like crazy. And so, anyways, I'm saying all of that to say <laughs> one of the stories that I was reading this morning, or the place that I was in, man, in the book of Joshua, it just stirred me up big time. So I just want to share a little bit about that with you guys too, because it's just... This is huge, man. This is huge. So it's just amazing. So I just want to share some of that. So we'll start with some of the stuff that I just got an hour or two ago. And then we'll go into some of the stuff from the Old Testament from this morning um, that I found. So <clears throat> I have a lot of scriptures. I'll probably just read these to you guys as opposed to us flipping to them. You can flip to them too if you want. I'm not saying don't, but I'm just saying, but can I go through somewhat quickly. So I'm going to start in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 2. And that says, And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me. 
Let me say that again. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me or spoke unto me. And the Spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me and set me upon my feet that I heard him that spoke unto me. Now, what's my point about this? Man, the Spirit enters your heart when your heart is open. The Spirit can only enter your heart when your heart is open. Man, when your heart is closed, see? The Spirit can't enter a closed heart. The Spirit can't enter your heart when your heart is not open to Him. So we have to have an open heart. And that's kind of part of what I was saying about, I, I, I think for my own self, as I look back over these years, I think that's a big part of it. My heart is just so open. Because the, the more time you spend in the Word, man, the more you're connecting to Him, the more you're believing it. The more you believe, the more you trust what you're hearing, the more your heart is going to be open to it. See, so when I, you read the Bible over and over and over, your heart just becomes more and more open to the Lord and what He's saying. And I remember John 6, 63 says, this is Jesus speaking, He said, hey, and my words are spirit and they are life. So every time you're reading the word, you're not just reading the word, but the Holy Spirit is coming with it. Okay, and so when you're reading the word, we want to have our hearts open because we're taking in the word. Remember what we talk about all the time. Um, Psalm uh, uh, 119, 135, I believe. I might be wrong on the address, but the entrance of thy word gives light. That light is the Holy Spirit. That light is that revelation, okay? And that's what, we're, that's what we're after. We're not just reading the Word just to read the Word or say, oh, hey, I now I know that, uh, you know, Moses did this. Well, that's great that Moses did that, but how does it apply to your life? How does it affect you? See, we're not just trying to get some information here. Man, we're after revelation. We're after it impacting us. We're after it changing our lives. And that is why our hearts need to be open. See, because when our hearts are open, now that word can come in and bring that light. When our hearts are open, that word can come in with the power of the Holy Spirit and it can begin transforming and changing our hearts. Okay? <clears throat> and the Spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me. Every time you read that word, that is God speaking to you. Everything in here is God speaking to you. If he said it to Moses, he said it to you. If he said it to Joshua, he said it to you. If he said it to Paul, he said it to you. If he said it to Peter, man, he said it to you. Because God's no respecter of persons. If God will do something once, man, he'll do it again. Okay? Now, <clears throat> Acts chapter 8 and verse 21 says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. See, our heart has to be right with God in order to receive the things of God, in order for faith to work. I heard a man, I heard a man of God say this today. He said, uh, he said, faith only works for a man or a woman with a right heart to experience the power of faith. You can't be lying and stealing and expecting faith to work for you. He said, God is not a magician. He said, look, any monkey can learn the principles of faith. But it's so much more than that. Your heart has to be right with God. You can't just, you can't just try to work the principles, but your heart is not right with God. God is not a magician that's out here to just grant your wishes, okay? He said, without a right heart, you are not a candidate for faith to deliver. See, I'm not trying to come down on you. That's not what my objective is here. But I'm just saying, man, it puts in perspective. Hey, you know, Matthew 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 8 says this. It says, blessed. Hey, you want to be blessed? I'll tell you how. <laughs> blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God. See, a pure heart is so powerful, you guys. A pure heart is so powerful. And for, <clears throat> for me personally, I've gone back and I've been, this stirred me up today because this is what I've been focusing on for probably the last couple of years. And it's broken things wide open for me in so many areas. And even going back to when I was fighting with lust and porn, this was my focus, a pure heart. Now, I wasn't locked in on Matthew 5, 8, but I was locked in on having a pure heart. Because I knew if I had a pure heart, how could lust be in my heart if I've got a pure heart, right? It says, the, it says, blessed are the pure in heart. Man, so you got a pure heart. You're blessed. And watch this. For they shall see God. What does that mean? That means, that means you recognize what God is doing in your life. That means, that means when you pray, man, you know he hears your prayer. And you know he's answering your prayers. That's the pure in heart. See, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the scripture, but, but there's a scripture, and I believe it's in Hebrews, where it talks about not letting your heart condemn you. See, because it's like, man, if your heart is not right with God, then you're going to go and you'll be praying to him, and it's like, you know, I don't know if I did this thing, or I did that thing, and da-da-da-da-da. And you're not trusting that he's hearing you because you're hung up on whatever you did or whatever is going on in your heart. Maybe you're angry at somebody, you're offended over this happened or frustrated over that or how could this happen or da-da-da, whatever. And he said, hey, 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 man, no condemnation. You screw up, you do what 1 John 1, 9 says. You confess your sins before God or you confess your faults before God and guess what? And he's faithful and just to forgive, and he'll cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But it's walking with that pure heart before God. Because, man, guess what? <clears throat> when we know we're not walking the way God wants us to walk, and it's not, and I'm, I'm not even saying it's major things. It could be small things that you know, well, I shouldn't have done that. Maybe it's not a huge deal, but you know in your heart, man, man disobedience right there. I mean, I shouldn't have done that. Hey, I shouldn't have, that's kind of a little sharp when I responded to that person or whatever. You see what I'm saying? But man, when you know your heart is pure, your heart's wide open because you got nothing to hide. You see, you got nothing to hide. See, it's a condemned heart that makes you want to hide from God, just like Adam and Eve. Man, once they sinned, what was the first thing they did? They hid from Him. See? So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And, <clears throat> you know, we've talked about this scripture a lot, especially over these last few months. We've been talking so much about the heart and, and what we're planting, what we're sowing into our heart and, and, and what we're trying to get, what we're uprooting or getting the junk out of the heart, right? <clears throat> well, Matthew 12, 35 it says, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Man, because what's in you is what's going to come out of you and produce all around your life. So how can your faith work if you got junk in your heart? We've got to get that junk out. That's all. No big deal. Let's just get it out. Let's just get it out of there. You see what I'm saying? Now watch this. Um, what do I got here? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> JMNT, of course, my new favorite. The good and virtuous person is habitually extracting and spurting out good and virtuous things. I love that. It's a, ex, extracting and spurting out. Is this coming out of you? Out of the midst of the good and virtuous treasure house of your heart. 
And well, now this is rough, I'll be honest. This is <laughs> rough. And yet the good for nothing and useless person is continuously extracting and spurning out worthless, oppressive, knavish, base, wicked, and evil things from out of the midst of the worthless treasure house. That's pretty rough, man. <laughs> yeah, that's like right there. But it puts it in perspective, like, man, what we're focusing on, right? We were talking about a couple weeks ago about Colossians 3, 2. I think we got to that, didn't we? I can't remember. I know we didn't get to all of it, but, but focusing on, man, you set your mind on the things above, you know? Because what you're focused on, what you're meditating on is what's going to be in your heart, and so then that's what's going to be coming out of you. That's what's going to be producing out of you. You know, the Bible says that a good, uh, a, a good man or a good woman is known by the, the, the fruit that they produce, right? So you can easily tell in your own life, okay, how is my relationship with God right now? How is it working? What's the fruit that I'm producing? Because people, people always say, oh, man, I love God with all my heart, and I just trust God. Woo-hoo! But then you say, well, what's the fruit, man? Right? And it's not, I'm not putting anybody down, but I'm saying, wait, hey, as, we just want to be focused on what's the fruit that we're producing. And then just adjust it. If there's some bad fruit that's being produced, well, man, let's cut that thing off. Right? Let's just cut that thing, and let's go over here and start producing some good fruit. Okay? Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus talking here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The door of what? The door of your heart. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm not going to miss the TV turn off every time, every week now at the new place. <laughs> um, let me show you this real quick. I like this in the JMNT. He says, Consider, I have stood and continue standing upon or at the door or the entrance, and I'm constantly knocking. If ever anyone may or can hear my voice or sound and would open the door, I will proceed entering, coming or going in toward him. And then I will continue eating the evening meal with him and he with me. See, it's never an issue with God. He's always, I have stood and continue standing at the door. See, he's always knocking. He's always speaking to you. The, the Holy Spirit always wants to come into your heart more and more and more and more. He wants that word to come into your heart more and more and more and more. He's always speaking to you. He's always talking to you. He's always leading you and guiding you. So the issue is never with God. It's just sometimes if we get a little bit of junk in our heart, it can be a little bit harder to tune in or to recognize what he's saying. Or, you know, your heart can be a little bit closed up because this or that or whatever is going on. But here's what's amazing about this. Okay? In Acts chapter 16 and verse 14, it says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Theatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. See, here's what I love. It says, whose heart the Lord 
open. He, he opened her heart. He opened up her heart so that she could hear what Paul was preaching. God's never going to let you stay in a situation where he doesn't provide you a solution or an answer. Her heart was closed, so what did the Lord do? He opened it up. And so for you, if there's a situation where, man, your heart, you feel like your heart is closed or it's, it's just what, man, he'll open it up for you. He's say, I'll open your heart for you. Because that's what he does. That's what he does. He'll open your heart for you. But we have to turn to him to let him do it. See, because he's a gentleman. He's knocking in his... Remember it said, he stands at the door and he knocks. He said, doesn't say he bursts his way in. <laughs> doesn't say, hey, I'm knocking. I'm going to force my way in there now. No, no, no. He says, hey, I'm knocking. You want to let me in? Hey, you let me in. I'll come and we'll have a party. <laughs> you know? He said, hey, we'll have a party, man. We're going to do some stuff here. I'm going to show you what life is all really all about. See, because when you let him in, <clears throat> when your heart is open to him, oh, now guess what? Everything that's working in God is now working in you because you are directly connected to him. So everything that God has, everything that he is, everything that's working in him, man, it's now working in you. I mean, how can you beat that? Everything that God is, that's now flowing into you. The divine life that he is, is now flowing into you when your heart's open to him. The divine love that he is, is now pouring into you. the completely undefeated nature of God that he is is now flowing into you. Has God ever lost? He never lost. Undefeated. And when we open our hearts to him, man, that's what we have. We have the undefeated one on our side flowing into us. Everything that he is is flowing into us. Everything that he is. How could you beat that? <laughs> you can't beat that. Oh, let me show you this real quick in the uh, jam and tea. So there was a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of or dealer of purple fabric from the city of Theatira. And she was a woman who stood in awe of God. Okay, look, look that's a huge key right there now. A woman who stood in awe of God, meaning what? She had the fear of the Lord. Right? We can't just be going to God and like, God, demanding God do this, God do this. <laughs> Man, you got to have that. We have that fear of the Lord. That honor, that respect, that awe of who he is. And I mean, the magnitude. But that's a huge key. She stood in awe of God. She began hearing and continued listening, whose heart, the core of her being, the Lord at once completely opened up or opened back wide to continue holding to, attentively accepting, and being devoted to the things being presently and progressively spoken by Paul. He wants to open our hearts so we can hear him more clearly, so we can receive that revelation from him more freely, more easily, more simply, so we can understand his ways at a greater level. See, because every time you receive a revelation, man, that thing is designed to, to take you to a new place, to put you in a new position, a new level, a new, pos a new stance, a new standing in your life. That's why he's trying to, he's like, let me, get, let me get your heart open so I can just pour what I've got out to you. That's 
and I, this is just my own opinion, my own thinking, but my, my guess is that probably our hearts can always be more and more and more and more open. You know what I'm saying? Because if you think about the magnitude of God, <laughs> what him coming in, you know, I just, I just, I don't know. This is the nature of God. You, you can always progress. You see what I'm saying? That's all. I guess my point is, you just, I don't think there's ever a point where you're like, well, I guess I made it. <laughs> I guess I'm good. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I love this too. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed. See, he'll not just circumcise your heart, but he'll circumcise the heart of your children. And you're not on the line. To love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, that thou mayest live. I love it. He'll, he'll circumcise your heart. See, again, I love this man God saying, hey, look, I got it for you. I'll do it for you. I'm going to open up your heart. I'm going to circumcise your heart. I'm going to cut off all that junk that's keeping you from hearing me with absolute clarity. That's keeping you from connecting with my divine nature, with every divine provision, divine healing, whatever it is that you need, divine love. And I will cut back that heart and get that thing so sensitive to me, so wide open, that you'll stay Stop all the struggling and you'll just receive from me. Because that's why we get into all this mess of like, you're trying to force things and you're putting all this, you know. Because <laughs> man, you just open up your heart. Because what? Get, hey, because faith what? Faith is a rest. And that's how we know when we're really walking in faith. And we're just like, this like I was telling you about, um, about the messages that I entered into that place where I was just was at rest. And because of that, whew, now they just flowed freely. You're, you know, we stopped that struggling. We stopped that pressing and pressing and pressing. <clears throat> oh, I wanted to show you this too. We mentioned John, uh, Matthew 5, 8. Earlier, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And I like it in this translation because he says, those who are clean in the heart, those who are clean in the heart are happy and blessed because they themselves will progressively see God or the folks that have had the core of their beings made clean are happy people in that they will continue to see God in everything. I mean, you see God in everything. You know, I read, a, uh, I, was re I don't remember what book it was. It was one of the David Oyedipo books. Um, it might have been in Satan Get Lost or it might have been in Commanding the Supernatural. I don't really recall, but he was telling the story. He said, look, man, so many times these parents are with, the, you know, looking at their kids and they're fussing and going on all about what the devil's doing or all this and they're seeing all this negative stuff. And he said, man, and they're just completely not even realizing the glory of the Lord that's all around them. You know, point being, man, when you're pure in heart, man, you're seeing God in everything and you're seeing what he's doing and not what the enemy is doing. You follow me? Because, because we read it um, a few weeks back. I think it was Titus 1.15, if I recall. But it said, no, no, um... Uh, whatever the address, we'll figure that out later. But the, the, the verse said, to the pure, everything is pure. To the unpure, or to the defiled, everything is defiled. Why? Because that's what you're, the lens that you're looking through. Man, when your heart is pure, you just see everything and everybody as pure. You know what I mean? And so when you do it, you just you see God in everything. You see all the things that he's doing. And that just builds your faith because you're constantly focused on what God is doing, not on what the enemy is doing, not on what's not working, not on your struggle, not on the difficulties, whatever.
praise the Lord. So those who are clean in heart, Psalm 51.10, this is one that I meditated on a lot um, back when I was going through all that stuff with the porn and the lust back before we were married. And that says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, see, this is David writing this, and this was after he had done the whole thing with Bathsheba. And so he had fouled up pretty big time, right? He's the king and did all this kind of stuff. And so now he's going to the Lord. And he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. See, he was smart enough to repent <laughs> and to say, Lord, this what? I don't want to live this way. Man, this is not working. This is not the right way. And he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew within me a right spirit. And that's, and that's been one of the confessions I've been doing too over the last year or two. That one in Matthew 5, 8. <clears throat> so, how do we get a clean heart, though? I mean, how do you get a pure heart? How do you get a clean heart? How do you get a pure heart like that so, you're, so you can see God, right? Well, watch this. Proverbs 30, verse 5, says, Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So every time you're putting that word in your heart, Purity, that holiness of his word is coming in with it. The more you're pouring that word into your heart, the more you're reading his word, the more you're meditating on it. Man, the more the purity of that word is coming into your heart and it's transforming you into his image. You know, Second or, um, I think it's either 2 Corinthians 4, but it talks about beholding him as in a glass. When you're looking into the words, it's like you're beholding as in a glass. And James talks about that too. Looking into the perfect liber law of liberty. Ephesians 5.26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. See, the word will come over you and just wash you like water. The APB Strong says that he should sanctify it, having cleansed it by the bath of water by the word. The JMNT, of course, I have to have this. To the end that he may set her apart, separate her, consecrate, and make her holy cleansing and purging her by the bath of the water that is within a result of a flow or in union with a gush effect or in the midst of a spoken word, a declaration or in utterance. In other words, I, I like to think about it like this. Man, when God speaks to you, purity of his word just comes in you. And that's why we say we open up our heart to him, then his spirit comes in, and the purity of his word, the purity of his Holy Spirit comes in. And it flushes out any kind of stuff that's not supposed to be there. But see, every time he speaks to us, whether he's speaking to you through the written word, or he's speaking to you into your, to your heart by that, that still small voice, every time he does, that purity is coming with it. That holiness is coming with it. And every time that's coming in, it's just connecting you on a deeper level with God so that your faith can operate at a more efficient level. Praise the Lord. Okay. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Romans 8:31 What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us?
So here's where I want to get into this story today, <clears throat> or that I was reading this morning that just lit me up. So it's in the book of Joshua, and we're going to look at chapter 10. And I'm not, I'm not going to read, I'll just read just some portions of this to you. Um, so let me, let me, let me just kind of lay the, the, the backstory a little bit so you understand kind of where we're jumping in here. So, um, of course now Joshua, you know, Moses passed away and, and isn't that amazing by the way, no, Moses, this has nothing to do with my message, but Moses, <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. Moses, it says the Lord buried him and nobody knows where. Even to this day, it says. Now think about that. The Lord buried him. <laughs> that's how close, that's how deep his relationship with God was. That's how open and pure his heart was towards God. The Lord buried him. No, no, I'm saying, don't. Joshua didn't bury him. Aaron was already gone by that time, but, but I'm just, no, 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 the Lord buried him. That's, I don't know about, that just, that just boggles my mind. The Lord buried him himself. But anyway, so Moses is gone. And, and so now Joshua has taken over. And, and of course, Moses didn't get to lead him into the promised land because of how he disobeyed God and smote the rock. When God told him, speak to the rock, and then he, used his rod and hit the thing. Um, I mean, that's kind of like we're saying. It's like, it's like trying to do stuff, trying to struggle and make it happen instead of just trusting what the Lord says to do. If he tells to do something, just do it. It's going to work out. I guarantee you. All right? But anyway, so Moses, Joshua was taken over. And so now they did the whole thing with Jericho. They, they took the city of Jericho. They did the, you know, walking around the walls and the walls just fell down just from you know, following the instructions of the Lord. And then now they've taken over the city of Ai. And so now they've taken over these two pretty good-sized cities. And so now um, <clears throat> these, these, these men, you know, they hear about this and they kind of are getting afraid of like, whoa, these guys got some power here, man. They're taking over Jericho. Now they've taken over Ai. And so these, these men come from Gibeon, but... And they come to Joshua and they, they put on a whole scam. I mean, they put on all these rugged clothes, they're moldy and they're gross and all this kind of stuff. And they come to him like, oh, we, we want to team up together. Let's, let's, let's join a union here. Let's team up. Let's make a covenant together, right? And he said, well, where are you guys from? Oh, we're from a far, far, far away country. But they weren't. They were from a neighboring country right next door. See, they lied to him and they scammed him. And so Joshua says, okay. So he goes and makes this covenant with these, these men from Gibeon without even really realizing that they were neighbors, right? And, and what, what I found was interesting in this is in chapter 9, verse 14, it says, And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. See, they didn't counsel with God before they did this. They didn't seek God's counsel before they did this. And so now they've got this, this, this covenant which, by the way, just a side note, there's a huge deal to make a covenant back then. Like, we don't get it, right? <laughs> and I think that's a big reason why a lot of us have a hard time really believing and just leaning upon what God says in his word as his covenant to us because it's lost such meaning. Like, back then, if you caught a covenant, there were, you, you, you didn't go back on it. Otherwise, you had, it was, the result was death if you went against it. Right? So they cut this covenant. And so now, they, they, um, these kings, there was five kings together. There was like the king of Jerusalem and Hebron and I can't remember who else, but all of the Amorite kings, right? So they seem up together and they're like, hey, look, we're going we're gonna to go and take over this land of Gibeon where these men were from because now they found out that Joshua and the Israelites were teamed up. And they're like, that's going to be too much power if... They're teamed up together because Gibeon was an even bigger city than I. So they set out 
to go to war against Gibeon. So the men of Gibeon come and say, hey, can you help us, Joshua? We need your help. So Joshua's like, okay, we'll come help you. And so um, in chapter 10, verse 8, it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not. Talking about these, these, these kings that were going to go against him. He said, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into your hand. He said, Look, I've delivered your enemies into your hand. Now remember, if God says anything to Joshua, to Moses, anybody, he's saying it to you too. He's saying, I have delivered your enemies into your hand. He's saying, there shall not a man of them be able to stand before you. I look at it like this. Whatever's coming against you, whatever you're bumping up against, I don't care what it is, man, the Lord is going to deliver it into your hand. Whatever that enemy is, I don't care if it's an enemy of, of, of lack, if it's an enemy that's a barrier trying to keep you from your destiny, a barrier trying to keep you from your spouse, a barrier trying to keep you from pr your prosperity, whatever it is, I'm not, I, whatever the enemy is, it does not matter. Man, he's saying, look, I'm going to deliver them into your hand. Now watch this. So Joshua therefore came up unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited them, or routed, destroyed. I mean, he took them out, right? Before he, The Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. Now take note here. It says, and the Lord destroyed them. The Lord destroyed them before Israel, and the Lord slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. And he chased them along the way that goes up to Beth Haran and smote them to Az Azekah and Makeda, Makeda, something like that. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were going down to Beth Haran, watch this, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah. And they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. See, the Lord killed more of them by raining down these, these hailstones than the Israelites did in their battle. What is he saying? He's saying, man, I can fight your battle a lot better than you can. Okay? He's saying, let me take that thing. He's saying, let me take that thing for you. Watch this. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 30. The Lord your God, which goes before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. So the Lord will fight for you. Deuteronomy 3.22, You shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 4, For the Lord your God is he that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to save you. Deuteronomy 28.7, The Lord shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will cause that to happen. Deuteronomy 31, ver, thir, chapter 31, verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that does go with you. He will not fail you, nor forsake you. And verse 8 says, And the Lord, he it is, that does go before you. I love that with these verses. He goes before you. He's out ahead of you. He's out clearing the way. He's out taking them head on before they even get anywhere close to you. He will be with you. He will not fail you. Neither forsake you. Fear not. Neither be dismayed. The point is, man, the Lord will fight on your behalf. He will fight for you. Just like he did for Joshua and the Israel. He'll fight for you. And all it is is us just trusting him to do that. 
Lord, get, cook, yes, Lord. get engaged on this thing with me, Lord. You know, I'm, I'm getting out of this, doing this thing of my own strength, because just like the Israelites said, he slew more of them with those hailstones than they were able to do with their swords. Okay, let me go back to this here. So, they were more which died with the hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Okay, now watch this. This is where it really gets <clears throat> crazy. Now, now, remember, we're talking about Joshua here, right? <clears throat> now, remember with Joshua, he was the only one, along with Caleb, that when they went out to spy the land, he was the only one with Caleb that came back and said, hey, we could do this thing. He was the only one that believed the word of the Lord that said, hey, go out and take that land. All the rest of them doubted, and guess what? Because they doubted, because they rebelled against the Lord and wouldn't believe what he said, they all died. And none of them got to see the promised land except for Joshua. And I believe Caleb. So <clears throat> I remember what, remember what he said to Joshua in the very first chapter when he had just taken over. Joshua just takes over, and what does he say to him? He says... He says, be strong and have a good courage. Be thou strong and very courageous. That you may observe to do all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn out from the right hand to the left. That you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. See, he's meditating in the word day and night. So man, his heart is pure. His heart's full of the word of God. His, he's deeply connected with God. So guess what? God said, hey, look, I'm coming to your rescue. I'm coming to fight on your behalf because of the relationship that we have developed by you following my orders, not murmuring and complaining and whining like the rest of the Israelites did. And as a result, God comes to his to back him up. Now, this is, this is crazy, you guys. <clears throat> now, here's verse 12 in chapter 10. And this is what I want to show you. Then spoke Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, he said this in front of the whole nation of Israel. Jo Joshua says this. Son, stand still upon Gibeon, and you moon in the valley of Ajalon. Now watch this. <clears throat> and the sun stood still. And the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. <clears throat> Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. <clears throat> so just consider this for a moment. Now look, it's only 7.30 here. It's completely dark out because it's already wintertime, but imagine it's 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning. And the sun is still up like it's noon. I mean, just consider that for a moment. That's what the Lord did. He backed up Joshua's words to the point where the sun stood still for nearly an entire day. And I know I get it. Sometimes we read these stories in the Old Testament and it's like, oh, it's a nice story. Man, this stuff is real. You know what I'm saying? Like, this stuff really happened. <clears throat> and so they lost an entire day. So if God is willing to do that for Joshua... What is he willing to do for you? And here's my guess. I don't know if I don't know what all you guys got going on, but my guess is your situation is probably not something as drastic 
as needing the sun to stop for an entire day. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So if God will back him up in that way, man, what will he do for you? And all he did was believe the Lord. He knew that's what he needed in order to, to finish this thing off. And so, now think about it. He didn't go in his prayer closet and hide out and say, uh, hey, Lord, man, let's, let's, can you just keep the sun up like for today? Man, he went and announced this in front of the entire nation of Israel. He had no fear that this might not work out, man. Because if it didn't, he'd look like a fool. But he had no hesitation to stand in front of the entire nation of Israel as their leader and just declare it in the presence of God and in the presence of their entire nation. And no shame, no fear. That's a pure heart. You know, that's an open heart that's doing that. And we can walk just like he walked. And that's even in the Old Testament, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how much more now with the New Covenant? Well, we got the very God Almighty on the inside of us. With everything that he's got flowing into us. Man. And then verse 14 says, And there was no day like that, before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. The Lord fought for Israel. And he's fighting on your behalf. I'm telling you, he's fighting on your behalf. And it's crazy because there's so many things that he's keeping at bay that we don't even know about. He's going before you. So he's out ahead of you fighting all kinds of battles, keeping all kinds of things from ever touching your life. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, because he loves you so much that he's like, hey, I'm going to war for you. And the greater our belief level in who he is and in what he has said to us and given us and promised and declared and made available will be the degree to which it manifests in our lives. If there's an area where you feel like you're struggling, man, purify your heart with the word of God. Because the pure heart is what will take your faith to that next level. It's like it, it's like it, it erases the questions, the doubts. Because if your heart's pure, how can there be room for doubts? How can there be room for unbelief? You know? Because uh, what is it, Romans, I think it's Romans 12.10 says, unbelief cuts you off, but faith engrafts you back in. See, the faith is what connects us to him. Unbelief is what cuts you off. Or fear or doubt, it cuts you off from him. So that flow of his divine nature is now no longer freely, freely accessible to us. That's why our faith is so important. That's why he, man, he's a faith God. He wants our faith. He wants our trust in him. I mean, it's the craziest thing, but what Jesus said, he said, look, he said, when I return, will I find faith in the earth? Like that, apparently, that was the most important thing to him that when he comes back, that he would see faith. I've never understood that. Because I'm going, what? You'd think you'd say, when I come back, will I find love on the earth? But he didn't say that. He said, will I find faith on the earth? So clearly that's the most important thing to him is having faith in him and trusting him and believing him. I mean, that's what this whole thing was with the Israelites. They didn't believe him. They complained and complained and they didn't trust him and they rebelled against him. And what is the rebellion all about? It just, it's just, they just didn't believe what he said. 
He flat out told them everything he was going to do, and they just wouldn't believe him. And he's saying, Matt, just want you to believe me. <clears throat> and I'll just tell you this. I'll end on this. I was thinking about this yesterday or today. I think yesterday. Because, you know, we were doing, we got the Heidi the Elf thing going on with the kids, you know. And so you, you know, she's, she's magic. And so you hide her every night. <clears throat> and, and I was thinking about this. I may have this more, but I was thinking about it. And I thought, she doesn't move at all during the day. She only moves at night while they're sleeping, right? And I thought to myself, how do they... <laughs> How do you not think, right? Okay, but my point is this. As I was thinking about it, the reason why they don't just figure it out is because they're just so programmed to believe. They just want to believe so badly. They just want to believe. They just want to believe so badly. And then it happens, like, over time, you get older, this happens, you get all this crap from the world. Excuse my, pardon my French, but I'm just saying, you get all this garbage from the world. And this happened, and people, you know, all the negative, that, oh, you, if, it's, if it's too good to be true, it certainly is. Let me tell you what. You know, all that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying be naive and stupid, but I'm saying it's like, we get so programmed and so hardened to disbelieve everything. You know, I was listening to a, a teaching one time, and the guy, he was talking about, man, he said, I tell you, I'm a believer. If you tell me that, you tell me the story that you fell from the moon and you landed here, I'll believe you, because I'm just naturally programming myself to believe. I don't want to program myself to disbelieve or be an unbeliever for everybody says. Because it's like, man, and I, and, I, and I think probably part of this is also because, look, they're my kids, and so I have the authority over them. But it is the easiest thing in the world. Well, it's but I'm just saying, it's, it's, it seems so easy to pray for them, to get them healed from stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like it just... And they just want me to. They'll, Dad, will you pray? I, the other day, I, uh, Elena had her stomach was hurting super bad. Oh, uh, pray for me. Okay. I pray for her. As soon as I'm done praying, oh, Dad, my stomach feels better already. You know, it's just, I mean, it's just like it's so easy. It's like, but, but, but I think it's because, yeah, a big part of it probably because I have the authority, you know, as a parent, whatever. But I think also part of it is because they just, they just want to believe so bad. They just want to believe it so badly. And so they just do. It's the same thing with Amariah. You know, whatever it is, it, it could be a headache, it could be the cold, it could be, you know, whatever. But I just, what, just pray with them and it's just, boom, it's gone. And we live that same way. We want to believe too. We're taking that same childlike faith, that same childlike attitude that, man, we just want to believe more than anything. We don't want to doubt. We don't want to question it. We just want to say, Lord, if it says it in your word, man, then it's true for my life. And watch this. Just like Joshua did, I'm going to act on what I believe. Because that's what he did now. He did that with the battle, with going up into Gibeon and fighting all those kings. And he did it with declaring that the sun needs to stop. He believed God would do it. And he took action on what he believed. See, faith is in the heart, but it's meant to be exercised. And we exercise it by taking action to show what we believe. See, because if you look at your life, you will notice that you take action on the things that you believe. Good or bad. If you, if you believe every winter you get a cold, then every winter you prepare yourself to get a cold, right? 
if you believe that you have divine health and sickness cannot touch your body, then you act accordingly. You don't mentally prepare yourself. You don't stock up with cold medicine. You don't start going and getting cough drops. You walk as though you know you're not going to be sick. If a symptom, symptom tries to come at you, you immediately take authority over it and you cast it out and you keep your day moving. But I'm saying you take action based on what you believe. You believe that if you go to your job tomorrow and next week, you're going to get a paycheck from the work that you do. Why? Because you believe that the employer will pay you. So you act on that belief. Well, how about if you trusted God and believed his word as much as you believe the word of that employer? You see what I'm saying? Because you don't know, I mean, say you take a new job, you don't really know anything about that company or the boss or whoever, you know? <laughs> you're kind of just taking them at their word that they're really going to pay you that amount of money on whatever your paycheck days are. And you got to just trust that they're really going to do it. Well, what if you just trusted that what God said he would do, that he would do it? With no contingency plans. See, they didn't have contingency plans when they went to war. They just went to battle. And they trusted that God would honor what he said when he said, fear them not, for I have delivered them into your hand. And he took, Joshua said, okay. The Lord said it, so we're going to do it. And they went and did it. Praise the Lord. That's what I got for you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Time we get.